there is so much out there to get mad about. Social injustices, class warfare, continued colonization, the act of destruction of our planet by those focused on profits and not people. We can find it overwhelming at times. The good news is there are equally as many, if not more, stories of people coming together and rising up against the forces at play. So the creators of Blueprints of Disruption have added a new weekly segment, Ravel Rants, where we will unpack the stories that have us most riled up, share calls to action, and most importantly, celebrate resistance. Okay, so today is Truth and Reconciliation Day. Santiago, what's that mean to you? It's a frustrating day because I feel like the one thing I've seen consistently is there has been more and more conversations about the history of the colonial violence, the history when it comes to residential schools, the oppression, settler colonialism. But it's just a constant reminder for me, the name at least, that there's been virtually no efforts whatsoever to actually do anything even slightly resembling reconciliation. This is not history. It's the lived present and reality of indigenous peoples in Canada. And I just, it's really frustrating, especially because like right now, like I'm, you know, I'm in school, I'm in the kind of environment where like they really like make a bit of a big deal out of this. But then people just go on and nothing changes. And it's it's frustrating in that way. You know, people want to, People want to make the stuff, especially like I'm in journalism right now, right? And 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 one thing that you see is people sometimes want to make like these stories about like indigenous resilience, right? Like they want to celebrate, like oh look how look how strong you've been in the in the face of all this oppression. And I don't know; those stories always kind of rub me the wrong way because because yeah, like that's out of necessity. That's that's survival, but. But you can't just be like, good job for surviving in these horrible conditions that we've created for you. We're not going to do anything to actually change those conditions. And so you don't have to be so resilient, but good, good on you. Yeah, it's a bit paternalistic. That historical perspective, too, reminded me of a conversation I had with my little as he went to school on Friday. And so that was the day was orange shirt day is what they call it. So already the name of the day at school is a little bit sanitized. I mean, I get it. So he has an Every Child Matters shirt. And I ask him, what do you already know about this day? And when he was trying to say indigenous, right, he was kind of mangling the word, but I could understand what he was trying to say. He described indigenous peoples as those who were here before us. And every time he spoke, it really had that kind of past tense narrative that it's something in our past, that even they are something in the past, that they don't exist in in, in modern day. And that worried me because essentially what your kids hear at school is to probably dependent a lot on the teacher that they have and their understanding and their acceptance of what happened and what is going on. And there's a lot of denialism out there. And I understand there's maybe a little bit of downplaying for younger kids, but I, I remember growing up not learning anything about it anything meaningful about indigenous people it was horrifically racist from today's perspective as like i'm picturing what our textbooks look like and it w- and it was all very historical there was there was no modern day connections to the issues that we see today and i mean a lot of our listeners will will not disagree with us that There's continued colonialism, but I'm not sure the mainstream Canadians are ready to accept that. Also, there is orange sprinkled donuts for sale at Tim Hortons and someone this morning showed 
cakes with the orange or red handprint on them being sold at Loblaws. Uh, it's not meant to be a celebratory day. We've seen some communities even throw block parties and ask just everyone to wear an orange shirt. And so I think, yeah, there's a lot of folks out there that just see this as another day and and aren't willing to accept changing the, the conditions that are continuing. And so, so like they talk about all the historical things, like we say, but there is so many large issues movements right now of indigenous resistance going on that are being completely ignored you know it's too many to remember them all to be honest it's and it's not just you know i mean there's plenty in ontario there's plenty across the entire country and there's no effort whatsoever <laughs> To do anything about any of that, all in all of these issues, they're they're not getting the the coverage they deserve. They're not getting the support that they deserve. They're just swept under the rug. And I, I guess it's easy because m many of these communities are it's, it's happening outside of like the eye of urban Canada, right? It's not something you see in your day to day in the same way. So it's easy to ignore it, but. Still, I mean, if 8,000 people show up for a march on Queen's Park like they did this week, that's news. Surely if 8,000 people, <laughs> I had another word for that, but showed up in red hats and Confederate flags and typical convoy-esque regalia, if 8,000 of those people were on Queen's Park, then it would have been top news. But the March for Land by the Land Alliance, Northern Ontario, first five First Nations in Northern Ontario, had a massive action, and it wasn't just them. A lot of coalitions were there, and you really had to dig. I mean, I, I found mine on Humber News. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, outside of Humber, uh, the only thing I found was... CBC News, I think, yeah, one. The obligatory, you know, FYI, all these people showed up. It's a really kind of skim the surface. Yeah. S singular CBC article. article. And, and that's it. And that's that's all there was. And, you know, one thing that, like, caught my attention to is that, like, these, there was Indigenous leaders who were coming in from fly-in communities. You know, communities that, and having, you know, just traveled to Northern Ontario uh, earlier this summer, I couldn't help but think, oh my goodness, that is expensive. Like, that is a lot of money to fly into Queen's Park. And, and what were they looking for? You know, they were, they put down a table, brought in some chairs, had a chair for, Doug Ford, and they were asking him to sit down and speak with them. I mean, least I, they came hundreds and hundreds of kilometers away just to ask him to speak to them. Well, that's hitting at the duty to consult, right? So we're going to talk about a few acts of Indigenous resistance here and why they're doing what they're doing, a, a bit of the story behind it, but the theme in all of these, especially when you're talking about land defenders and resource extraction, is this kind of really vague duty to consult Indigenous communities. There's no clear structure or instructions on exactly what that looks like. So even though it's guaranteed in many acts and is required, especially for when we're talking about the Ring of Fire, it's very selective how it's applied. And obviously it was, a you know, like most things, political. It was designed this way. It's allowed room for interpretation. So there was a lot of issues brought up in the March for Land, I'm sure, but the focus there was on stopping mining in Northern Ontario in an area that's referred to as the Ring of Fire. 
this is like 5,000 square kilometers of land in northern Ontario. So we're, we're 500 kilometers north of Thunder Bay. Okay, so when Santiago says fly in community, he's not kidding. I mean, that's about as far away in Ontario as you can get from Queen's Park. And this is rich with minerals needed for batteries. And Doug Ford likes reminding folks that specifically for electric vehicle batteries. So he's trying to court to some environmentalists out there that are like, but we need it. Remember those electric cars that you think are the solution to absolutely everything? Well, we need that. This is absolutely imperative to our economy and to the future and even to curbing climate emissions. And so from the get-go, Premier Ford has been determined to mine this land. And like all of these land claims, I mean, it's not an official land claim, but disputes over resource extraction and Indigenous communities, they were able to sign agreements with two First Nations in the area. So what they've done is the two very closest First Nations groups through their systems and a duty to consult have agreed. But a quick look at the map that we'll link in the show notes shows you it's an intricate map of many different Indigenous communities all downstream, some of them already under boil advisories. You know, we've got the OG Cree First Nations have been under a boil water advisory there for 26 years. So the last thing they want on land connected to them is mining. So by getting approval in whatever form or by sending memos perhaps to the other First Nations, Doug Ford's, under the pretext of duty to consult, has done his duty. And then it's always up to these First Nations groups to then go through courts or stage protests and either way expend incredible energy simply to get Doug Ford to sit down at the table. And it it, it does also, like an, having gone up, seen some of the conditions... Not all the, like I saw very little, I got a snapshot, but I talked to people who talked to me about the conditions that they're living in, in their communities, you know, um, from all over that, that, that exact region we're talking about, you know, there, there's so many issues when it comes to like food insecurity, diabetes prevalence, just not having safe, well, all of these things, right. That if the provincial government was to come in and say, Hey, We'll give you some jobs and some money if you let us exploit your land. There's people who will agree to that. And that is under duress. That is under... uh, There's a word I'm looking for uh, that I'm not quite finding when people make agreements that... But, like, they kind of have to. Um, Well, I think under duress is a perfect word to describe it. It's being forced into an economy of capitalism, right? So if you starve folks from any kind of other income and resource and and the world is now designed to operate that way. That's the way. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, that was killing me. No, yeah, but it's true. It's true. And you can't fault some groups for signing whatever agreements. And quite often our leaders get us into deals that the masses don't want to be in either, right? When we talk a little bit about Ferry Creek blockade, they're both their elected and hereditary Indigenous leaders from the immediate area don't agree with the blockade. Sometimes things are really complicated, but like I said, there's quite often we sign into free trade agreements with other nations that most of us do not want and will not benefit from. So it doesn't exactly make it right, but... What's happening here in Ontario is clearly another one of Doug Ford's already made promises to corporations. People are expecting this resource extraction. I mean, they spent $1 billion or earmarked $1 billion to start building roads up into these areas, roads that are only going up there for one purpose, and it's not to make 
the lives of indigenous communities up there easier or have better access to food and, and other needs. It's simply to facilitate this resource extraction and be able to do the old trick of, well, we've already laid the infrastructure down. We've already spent this money. We can't go back. We can't go back. We've already signed deals with mining companies, whatever it is. Like, it's always the economy. It's always the economy. These injunctions and every time they're granted and all of the legal rulings almost always tend to sit on the economic argument. And so governments will do whatever it takes to make it economically impossible to, you know, back out of some of these deals. The environmental assessments, a lot of the indigenous groups that were marching last week, one of their biggest claims there is the environmental assessments just aren't up to snuff, as well as the duty to consult. And we know this, for this board government at least, to be absolutely true, because when all the dirt came out about the green belt and even the Bradford Bypass up here, they are really tailoring what an environmental assessment even is and what its requirements are. And this is the same government that's removed almost any oversight in terms of environment to begin with. So it's it's no wonder that they're they're not reassured by any environmental assessment done by the provincial government. So but the recourse is now disobedience. And I mean we started off this episode by mentioning, you know, today is Truth and Reconciliation Day, right? I, I just need to reiterate, like, they're just asking to be talked to here. They're asking the government to sit down and talk to them. And they're refusing to do so on the, like, days, literally the week of Truth and Reconciliation, and they're refusing to do so when they came all the way down to Queen's Park from a distance that is greater than the dis- than the size of most countries. You know, this is, it's bullshit. This is, shows you the bullshit that they, they don't fucking care about reconciliation whatsoever. They'll admit to some wrongdoing, some of it. I mean, they'll, They'll try and justify it they, they, with their revisionist history as much as they can. But it's absolutely disrespectful. It is, but they don't just want a seat at the table, though. That is that is the bare minimum. And like obviously, you've got to get to the table in order to say no. They want the ability to also have control because what is the duty to consult if you consult and they say no and you're like, well, we I don't always it. listen to my paid consultants. Like clearly someone's not listening to their PR a lot of the time. Right. So it it even the phrase duty to consult doesn't really inherently mean sovereignty. No. Nope. Self-determination. Because. This is where I want to go over to BC. And I quickly mentioned Ferry Creek Blockade. The company, and we have an update for that, but the company at the heart of that is Teal Cedar. And so they are a logging company. I'm, I'm sure they get up to other things, but we're talking about old growth logging. We've talked about it on the show before. It's not good. It's out of control. And even attempts to curb it and attempts at reconciliation and duty to consult have ended in a lawsuit. So I'm going to give you the Coles notes. I'll link you to a great Narwhal article that explains it all. But the Haida Gwaii and the area there is and has been the site of old growth logging for quite some time. But resistance grew to it. And also that coincided with the governments in BC making promises to consult in a more meaningful way. And so a council was created that was basically half BC government, half Haida Gwaii, one person they both agree on, And they would determine the regulations around old growth and other things in that area, right? That was the level of sovereignty that they were given. And even when 
through all these official structures created around reconciliation and self-determination were created and used and decided that they would lessen the amount of old growth logging allowed on their territory, their territory, they're now being sued for $75 million by Teal Cedar for saying no. So it's like, you have the duty to consult. You can actually form this council. You can have say. The government can even agree with you. But if you have cost a company money, potential profits, you could still be on the hook. So even when there are steps towards reconciliation, the systems that we have here just won't allow it. Now, this is still before the courts. We don't know how it's going to play out. But Essentially, what the company's argument is around reconciliation is that private companies, that's not their problem. They agree there should be reconciliation, but in no way should it influence any kind of forestry regulations. It should never eat into their profits. That's the government's problem. That's a taxpayer's problem. They're not going to they're not going to take step in that, even though they're logging on indigenous land. They want no part in the reconciliation. So and these are the same fuckers that filed an injunction against the Ferry Creek, against the Ferry Creek blockade. I'm pretty sure that they, they use the same argument uh, at 1492 Land Back Lane, right? Where it, it was the, the government's responsibility and the company could do whatever they want. So therefore they could develop on that indigenous land, right? This is the same shit they always say. Right. And a lot of the free trade agreements that we have and a lot of the laws that we have facilitate this. They treat corporations like human beings with inherent rights to profit. And it's been extremely detrimental. And this is now being applied even when steps have been taken to make sure indigenous folks have self-determination. So. Always the courts, right? Always the courts, even the injunction against Ferry Creek blockade. The only reason it's really not there right now is because Teal Cedar decided that they didn't want to renew it. If they had decided to renew it, it's quite likely that it would continue. And folks who've never heard of the Ferry Creek blockade, I don't know how. But again, it speaks to what Santiago was talking about at the beginning, the lack of exposure that indigenous acts of resistance get, particularly land offenders. But this is Canada's single biggest act of civil disobedience, and it hardly got any airtime. The RCMP have arrested over a thousand people there over the last two or three since early 2021. Mind you, typical to form, you know, they only charged 400 of those people. 146 of those charges were dropped because the cops weren't up on the up and up. And you, yeah, you hardly get a whiff of this. So I would love, you know, if the folks from the Rainbow Flying Squad, this is the group that's organized a constant blockade there despite court injunctions. If they ever want to come on, I would love to speak to them because the fortitude it must take to maintain a blockade for that long, despite all those arrests. And, you know, again, they're not the only indigenous group going toe to toe with going toe to toe with Teal Cedar out in B.C. It would be impossible for us to make sure that we covered all of the pending court cases or injunctions groups of land defenders that are using all the tools available to them. But in the end, it always does boil down to economic need. Even when uh, folks from Mohawk First Nations were blocking the railways up near here in Ontario, near Trenton. And, you know, it was just a matter of days before the OPP went in there and removed them and all of it pended just on moving cargo, the need to keep Canada's economy going. We can have rulings on reconciliation. We can have provinces that ratify the United Nations declaration undrip, right? I'm going to get this wrong. the United Nations Declaration on Rights of Indigenous People. And it still doesn't matter. 
it still doesn't matter. They still end up at the mercy of singular judges who are bound by considering the rights of corporations. So whatever the solution is, likely doesn't lie in our law. That I think, if anything, is going to allow all of these groups to have self-determination over their land is a completely new understanding of what Indigenous sovereignty is. And we can just, I feel like reconciliation is just a term that isn't even achievable. It almost implies that there was a healthy relationship that we're just trying to get back to. And that's not accurate, at least not in the eyes of, of colonial settlers, right? They've never acted in good faith. They've never acted according to the two-row wampum belt where, where indigenous sovereignty was maintained. That was never a possibility, and it still isn't. So even when they're all signing these papers and getting applauded and taking these mediocre steps, it's still never their intention to give actual rights over the land, even in unceded territories. Even land claims that we do see finally working their way through the courts, like I'm talking indigenous land claims on provincial governments on or on crown land, those are almost only ever settled when there is resource extraction pending. Otherwise, they are tied up and stalled and not prioritized whatsoever. And I think when we look at truth and reconciliation, it really should just be a drive for indigenous sovereignty on land. Like I was wearing my land back sweater. I didn't have an orange shirt warm enough to take my kid to the bus. So I had my land back sweater on. And so I'm trying to explain to my little what orange shirt day really is. And I get to the part where I was like, well, you know, our ancestors kind of, you know, I'm only second generation Canadian, but I'm, I'm a white settler. So I'm like, our ancestors came over and pretty much stole this land. I'm talking to a six-year-old. Okay. So keep in mind, it's trying to be as simplified as possible. And he gives me the, well, but we didn't steal it, right? Like we didn't steal it because he's mortified by this, right? We're living on stolen land. He gasps. He's like, oh no. And I'm like, well, no, we didn't, but we benefit greatly from that stolen land. And our families always have, you know, and we continue to treat people in the ways that they're going to describe residential schools to you today. You know, like that is a continued behavior. And I I think that's kind of the lessons they should be teaching kids in school. I'm not sure what some of the kids are getting, but yeah, our idea of what role we have to play moving forward, I think is got to move beyond land acknowledgements and wearing orange shirts on one day. Where is the reconciliation? Where is, like, what have we, what, what, like, I can't honestly think of a single thing we've done to try and improve the conditions that Indigenous peoples are living under. I can't think of one thing. I can think of multiple things that we're currently doing to make it worse. I'm trying to be fair, and I'm really searching my brain, and... I can't because like I said, like even when you do see steps, like I think on the surface, there are some things the BC NDP did, but they were all very like gift wrap. Once you opened it, it, it really had no teeth. It really meant nothing, uh, nothing much changed. So I think Politicians have become better performers and they know how to talk a good reconciliation game and pose for the right photos. But their understanding of it is, is it's not really their problem. I need to pull up because I wrote a last year, the second story I ever wrote for Humber News was for Truth and Reconciliation Day. And I remember I interviewed Skylar Williams and I asked him about this. I asked him about reconciliation. And 
he he said he here's a quote from that he said there's no systemic change that has happened all the same stuff only now they're shaking our hands and stabbing us in the back well he said that a lot better than i did <laughs> <laughs> i asked um a a, a, a coordinator lori okemwenu sorry if i'm butchering the name uh a health support coordinator at the toronto council fire uh toronto council fire native cultural center i asked her you know about that commitment of achieving reconciliation of indigenous people and she said not enough is being done she said quote there's so much more that the canadian government can do first of all give the indigenous people their land back she said we're living in the same system we can keep talking about it but if the government doesn't change and really take action and honor the trees then we're all still the same yeah and i think about the indigenous groups and i it i gotta be careful not to sound paternalistic but i know what will happen in those relationships that they're forced to build with resource extraction companies because we're seeing it play out in bc even when there is a letter of understanding and mechanisms in place if they don't get what they want, Indigenous people are going to pay the price. And any any resource extraction company that is essential that isn't owned by Indigenous people is going to be exploitation continued. It's not for me to determine their fate, obviously, but these relationships are not healthy. And these companies have proven track records of disregarding any kind of means of reconciliation or even the respect of civil rights. A BC judge even ruled the injunction and the behaviors around the injunction at Ferry Creek were complete disregard for civil liberties. They were not even allowing the press in. And you can see by the numbers of people that are actually still facing charges versus those that were being arrested, they were unlawfully detained then. You don't just mass arrest people and then just throw random charges. Like, this is complete abuse. We saw this at the G20. And this behavior is applied anytime land offenders actually then have to stand their ground, right? They go through the courts, the courts fail them, every mechanism fails them. The last resort is obviously putting your physical body on the line and from what's wet's in a fairy creek to mohawks in in ontario to the fishermen the micmac fishermen over in nova scotia it's always been enforced by police and siding on economic interests it would be prudent to also remind folks when we're talking about the lack of reconciliation Surely finding the remains of known murder victims, Indigenous women, is one of them. Search the landfill is not going away. Kudos to the organizers there. They've maintained that blockade. They have shut that landfill down again. And we have seen coordinated actions from coast to coast in solidarity with demands to search the Brady landfill. Still being rejected by the premier there who is spending resources trying to defend her pathetic position that it is too dangerous to search the landfill. And I think this is gaining momentum because it just speaks so loud and clear that there's a price tag on Indigenous lives. Reconciliation is something we're willing to talk about, but never pay for. And to me, it's reminding me also of how folks like to say that they're socially progressive, but fiscally conservative. Because I think cases like this just make it so perfectly obvious that you can't be that, that you can't worry about the economic bottom line above all else. And the way that these arguments are always formulated is is always with this certainty that lost profits are a bad thing, that we center everything on this just constant need for growth and expansion and everything else is in the way, 
right? These highways need to be built. These mines need to happen. We need the wood to consume. And it's just, I, I guess as a socialist, it's troubling because clearly a society is faulty that doesn't prioritize the needs of people first. It sounds like a broken record, but how that is not painfully obvious to people, how the, the economy doesn't actually even measure how well we're all doing. And so all of these arguments just seem so absurd, right? That it costs too much to search a landfill. What is too much? What is too much? We just sent $650 million so Ukraine could get armored vehicles, but don't worry, they're built by Canadians. Like, there's always enough. There's always enough. And we have just chosen not to reconcile with our past and to keep going. Yeah, it feels like it's just gaslighting whenever they say that. You know, there's not enough money. And then they go and they spend absurd, unfathomable amount of money on other bullshit. You know, oh, we got to go build a few warships. Let's give Irving billions. You know, it's it's bullshit. You know, it's absolutely bullshit. And and these interests, these chasing the, the short term profits are just so self destructive and and for what, you know? Like one thing that like a lot of these things also come back to is, you know, we're destroying the land in the process and you know, one thing that I you hear a lot when you well, I've heard a lot when I talked in you know, like indigenous people is like how important preserving the land is to them how important that connection with with the nature and the animals is to them and then you they go and they rip it all up and tear it down and it is you know like we think like that 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 is a, that is a, a wound you know even even if you don't poison the water it's still a wound to rip up their land one thing i noticed when i flew to northern ontario was how untouched so much of it looked and ford looks at the same piece of land and sees money anybody who's ever seen a mine particularly from the air would describe it as a wound for sure a blight and it's so ironic that much of the colonialism, almost all of it, the imperialism was done under the premise that those coming over were more civilized. Yeah, it justified the residential schools. It justified so much of the behavior, that mentality that the way Europeans operated was so much more sophisticated and advanced <clears throat> and beneficial to humanity when in like 300 years you've managed to destroy a planet that's been here for who knows how long. I mean, someone knows how long, but I don't. <laughs> that's a mentality still held by people, right? You've got to imagine how many people still look at indigenous ways as something incredibly antiquated and in need of conforming or modification or advancement. And there's been so many examples where we've, from fire prevention to land management to water to political structures, right? Even where we've actually, we now know that we would be so much better off if we had followed their lead. You know, what I can't help but think of is, you know, like, because as they're cutting down all these forests, you know, you see that they say, oh, don't worry, we're going to plant them back, right? And they go and they plant acres and acres of a singular type of tree, right? And then... You see people who, like, they go and they, after a few years, and they document, like, what 
what's it like there? And it's, there's trees, but there's no life. There's no life because an ecosystem is more complex than that. And, and the arrogance of Western society is that, oh, we can just will it back into existence. But no, there's, there's no animals and the ground is dead. And it's nothing like what it was. It's such an arrogance what we're doing. We're destroying so much and we think, oh, don't worry, we'll capture the carbon and that'll fix things. Or we'll plant more trees and, and that'll fix things. And we've monocropped our soil into oblivion and we've torn... We, it, like, Go look at Canada on a satellite and see the fucking knife that we've carved in through the prairies of all the farms all dedicated to monocropping. Look at on Southern Ontario, all the farms dedicated to monocropping, all that soil has been eroded. We're destroying such large parts of the planet and, and destroying all like the, the lives of people, the lives of animals. And it just, you know, th this land existed for thousands of years, completely different to what it is today. And we think that this is better. We think that we've improved things. Well, I don't think anyone listening does, but... No, I know. <laughs> I think that's why, though, Indigenous sovereignty actualized is going to be a critical tool in climate justice. And in addressing the whole slew of things that you're talking about, especially related to the planet. And it can't just be a consultation here or there. It really needs to be land back. And that may be really uncomfortable for settlers to hear. And it might create an incredible unknown. But surely whatever path we're on now is not a good one. And whether even you agree with it or not, it's what is owed at the very least to even begin attempting any kind of reconciliation is, is to honor that truth that we are on stolen land and we don't know what the fuck to, we're doing with it. And, you know, like one thing that like I just I was just remembering was, you know, because we we're talking about like this idea that like the people, the indigenous people that were here were primitive, primitive and, you know, savages. And, you know, like I think about I think of, because like I'm I'm from South America, I think about like how advanced so many of the societies, uh, whether it's the Incas, the Mayans, the Aztecs, you know, were. In, in agriculture and in, in, in so many different ways. And the only real reason that colonialism was successful in places like that was because the diseases wiped out millions and millions of people. Right? And it's it's not history isn't what they teach it is. These were not primitive societies these were it's this european exceptionalism you know this western exceptionalism that's so arrogant and it also dismisses you know the contributions in in fields such as science and mathematics that come from africa and come from asia and you know this idea that all advancements come from the enlightened europe is so ignorant to history it it's what holds white supremacy and its ideology together, right? It has been perpetuated and continued for that purpose. And yeah, it's clearly wreaked havoc and it clearly remains in the psyche of many, many, many Canadians. Otherwise, we wouldn't stand for what we are seeing happening to First Nations across the country in particularly in court cases and what they face from 
the mounted police. There's an image that often floats around around Truth and Reconciliation Day. It's a painting of women, indigenous women, fending off RCMP officers, removing their children. Right? And in a way, that is still happening. We don't have all the time in any singular show to list off all of the horrific things being visited on Indigenous people. But just this week, we found out, you know, there's a doctor who has admitted to forced sterilization on Inuit women, and the police won't even investigate it. So between the child services that are removing First Nation children from their homes disproportionately and against most rules, putting them with settler families or families not within their community, we are still taking Indigenous children from their communities in so many ways. In so many ways. With these boil water advisories, you're basically saying get out of your community. With inadequate schooling, you're basically telling folks to remove themselves from their community and they have to like flying to school and so every time we paint or even use these images as they are like completely historical on truth and reconciliation day like we are like remembrance day you know we're just remembering something from our past that we will never repeat i think it's most important takeaway is that we are actively repeating these in way more creative ways that we have somehow found acceptable as a society while we sit and look on horrified at acts past. Very few people would defend residential schools right now, but would find a way to justify the removal of Indigenous children from child protective, using child protective services. It's been legitimized in so many ways, right? Court cases, legislation, so-called councils of cons consultation that are meaningless. So, lots of work. That is a wrap on another episode of Blueprints of Disruption. Thank you for joining us. Also, a very big thank you to the producer of our show, Santiago Halu Quintero. Blueprints of Disruption is an independent production operated cooperatively. You can follow us on Twitter at BP of Disruption. If you'd like to help us continue disrupting the status quo, please share our content. And if you have the means, consider becoming a patron. Not only does our support come from the progressive community, so does our content. So reach out to us and let us know what or who we should be amplifying. So until next time, keep disrupting.